seven, one. We're back, we're live. Welcome back to Think Tech and our three o'clock rock. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Tech Talks. Certainly everyone has heard of claims and sanctions around the hacking of our presidential and other elections in November. And we've heard of hacking in so many other places and contexts. After all, North Korea hacked Sony badly two years ago, and there have been regular hacks into government and industry in the U.S. and Europe ever since then. Seems like hacking is the word of the day, the new normal. And as it gets more malicious and dangerous to us and everyone else in the world, we should be increasingly concerned about it. Some say hacking large companies and government agencies by state actors or by state agents for actors is tantamount to war without the blood. Some go so far as to say we are not only at war, but that the level of hacking is really World War III. But do we know how they do it and how we can catch them doing it? No, not really. Maybe government knows, but the public doesn't really know much about it. Until now, until today. Today we have cybersecurity expert Andrew Lanning, who is incidentally the co-host of Hibachi Talk on Fridays. And he's going to elucidate what's going on in detail in the latest threat to our country and our society and our civilization. No stress, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome thanks. to the show, Jay, Andrew. Thanks Lanning. for having me. And happy right, New right. Year. Right. It's good happy to be New back Year. on ThinkTech. I think I was here Friday. <laughs> We could never have enough of. Thanks you. for that great intro. Oh yeah, that's a. That, I'm scared. We might, you I'm know. I'm scared too. They, they might shut us down right in the middle of this if <laughs> well, we get into might. too much of that detail you're talking about. You know, about. I mean, yesterday or the day before, and or the day before, every international airport in the country was stopped because the computer system that uh, Homeland Security and Customs uses to uh, to vet people, you know, to, uh, to vet people on the way into the country mm -hmm. from foreign ports. Uh, was broken for hours. I don't know if they finished fixed it even now. Um, and you know, it, it can't. You can't help but thinking, my goodness, this is, you know, a, a tiding of things to come. Um, maybe this is some intentional maneuver. It's not the first time that Homeland Security and Customs have lost their computer system, but this is the first time it affected every international airport in the country. It's, it's a little scary that this mm. could happen. And it really makes you wonder if there are state actors involved in that too, just giving us a warning, just telling us, watch out, because we can do this. Well, my th thought on that is that if, you know, if they're intent on coming in, they wouldn't want to shut the airports down. So to me, that's a little counterintuitive, but you never know what the intentions are. You know, yeah. infrastructure scares are one of the big concerns. Obviously, everyone's concerned about the, the power grid, the wastewater treatment plants. Um, all of these facilities have, um, are run by what's called programmable logic controllers, PLCs. Um, these are devices that are by and large an interface between the um, controlling software and the devices that are doing the measuring, generators, pumps, um, the, these field devices that me measure the flow of fluids, for example, through a pipeline or gas yeah, through a line. Do you remember Stuxnet? Sure. It comes to mind. And those were Siemens controllable... PLCs. PLCs. Sure. Yeah. And somehow uh, the Israelis working with the U.S. Uh, found a way to uh, uh, create a virus that would go around the world but only visit in the ones in the Iranian... Um, uh, centrifuges, nuclear centrifuges, hmm. and so uh, it was really quite remarkable that they they could they would only go into action when they when they found those Siemens PLCs, but you know it can be done again. It can be done in PLCs everywhere, and PLCs that do incredibly critical things for our grid, for our water supply, for you know all our. Um, civic infrastructure. All of the automation that occurs in, in our critical infrastructure in, in the city uh, is running with um, SCADA logic, right? It's, SCADA is a very old protocol. It's on that side that talks to all those devices. Those devices, by and large, sat alone, and we talked to them through, um, you know, relay logic uh, for many, many years. And then once they figured out how to put those onto the network, of course, they started talking via IP. And when they started talking via IP, those were initially, which is internet protocol, they were initially closed systems, closed networks. But as things have gone on, those uh, 
facilities ultimately brought in internet connectivity and the networks got internet merged and somehow they found a way uh, you know perhaps on purpose perhaps not on purpose but those controls were exposed to interfaces that were um, you know, able to be opened you know when you say hacking you're really just taking things that are available and putting them together in a new form right yeah so you know these um, in the internet's the, when we talk about these things we really have to talk about the people the processes and the products right so this is what this is composed of. people say IOT I call it the internet of theft um, <laughs> you, most people think of that as the internet of things and they think of the things but things are only a part of that um, of that equation the people are a part of the equation and the processes themselves are a part of yeah, the you equation. Got social engineering possibilities I mean that's the way hackers started uh, doing that. We had a hacker on think tech back in the, the middle 2000s uh, who uh, used social engineering to get into, get his, his, his software into people's homes. Sure. And he, you know, he had a way of uh, 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 appealing to them and they believed him. It's still uh, the preferred uh, method. So it, yeah. in fact, you know, we talk about the cybersecurity framework. Uh, I'm giving a talk to uh, the, Arm, the folks at uh, Record Arma next week. On, on, on a lot of this uh, procedure that we that NIST has built. There's great guidance out there on how to protect ourselves, but it's all of the technical controls. So we have a cybersecurity framework. We have a CSC top 20 controls. All of these things you can do to really, really limit the you know, attack surface that you have out there technically. But once I harden myself very well in my perimeter and all of my technology is sound, and I'm monitoring for people trying to get in, what's the next thing you do? Pick up the phone and call you call the guy on the inside and get him to give me his password right, or, or right. con and him out of giving me some that. information. Sure. You know, Herman, That's this is, this is way Mo. In. I'm on the fourth floor of the company. You see me all the time in the men's washroom, you know, and I just forgot my password. And could you just let me have, meanwhile, that call is emanating from Moscow. Yeah. And, and, but usually and you're, they'll call as your IT service company and, hey, I mean, I've got a problem with your account right now. I can see it's locked up. Can you do this? Yeah. Right. And so they'll, they'll try to get you to log in, share some credentials. Yeah. Or, or the utility in Texas that sent away to China for boards. Sure. For boards, uh, uh, you know, for their, uh, you know, uh, electrical generation equipment. Mm -hmm. um, and the boards come back with, from China with a little tiny chip that's not in the specifications. Mm -hmm. Just piggybacking on the board. And they're all trying to figure out what happened. So I well, can tell you a bit about that. I sit on, on UL Cybersecurity Committee, uh, Underwriter Labs, which is responsible for vetting a lot of that technology that's been implemented, right? Um, in, in your fire control systems, in your SCADA control systems. And there's really not in the past been a process to, not that there's not a process, there's not a um, guidance or a regulated process to determine that your lab and the environment that you're loading this firmware onto these chips in is clean, first of all. It's um, not available to penetration. In other words, it's a, a dark room. It's not connected to the network world where I'm loading this. And in fact, that the load of firmware I'm putting on that chip completely fills that chipset up or or that I can alert myself if that chipset's been tampered with after the fact once it goes out of production out in the environment is someone else taking it you know there's say you're only using 80 percent of the space available for your firmware well there's 20 percent more space to put malware in there and then I, if I'm a state actor for example and I want to get that type of equipment into a, a bunch of uh, of another government's military facilities or state facilities sure I'd love to be able to embed that into um, uh, Cisco routers, for example, and sell fake Cisco routers. So right, you fake know, Cisco routers that say fake Cisco. equipment. Sure, like yeah. you know, and and, and uh, you know, a procurement agent goes out and guy finds a way to to sell. He may not even know he sold stuff that's not. You know, he maybe got a great price on it, doesn't know why, but doesn't question it. And the procurement process doesn't look at it deeply enough. And next thing you know, yeah. there goes some. There it is. Sort of like contraband. Um, you know, fakes, they fake purses, yeah. they fake yeah. lots of stuff, and that's a f another form sort of hacking, if you think about yeah. it. Yeah, well, so, the, so a lot of the social engineering has happened, will continue to happen. Sure. And you have to be smart about it. Um, you, have to, you have to think like a, like a hacker. Uh, and there are people who make their living thinking like hacker. But I want to tell you an article that I saw okay. over the weekend, I think it was in the Times, and it said that in Russia, uh, Mr. Putin, remember him? Mr. Putin has made a concerted effort to build a veritable army of, sure. of hackers. Sure. And he's hired them from the schools, he's hired from industry, 
He gives them incentives. He gives them threats, whatever you need. Mm -hmm. uh, and he hires them from the prisons, too. Sure. Um, so there's all these people who are all under an intimidation, under sort of a control, a social control that he mm -hmm. has over them. And they're spread around the country. And they all work for this army of, of hackers. Mm -hmm. And they've been very successful. They, they hacked into the Ukraine. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as the war there was unfolding, they were bringing everything down. Mm -hmm. And now um, in the Baltics, you know, a couple of countries in the Baltics, you know, Estonia, Latvia, there's one other, uh, where it's funny, the same kind of thing is happening. Mm -hmm. Their power grids are going down on a regular basis. Their government agencies are losing computer control. Um, and it's just, it's too much coincidence mm. to be coincidence. Um, and so it's got to be coming from Russia. This is what he's doing. And, you know, I'm sure that social engineering is part of it, but there's a big part of it is getting in the back door, fi finding those ports, sure. uh, finding ways to actually insinuate malware into government, uh, mm -hmm. you know, government computer systems. And with very smart guys, very heavily motivated or threatened to do what they got to do. So my question or to well you... Paid. Uh, well paid. Well paid. Or a combination of the yes, four. Yes, all, you know, all the above. Sure. And um, so my question is this, you know, we have heard for years don't worry, Jay, because the United States of America has Silicon Valley. Uh, they have Andrew Lanning. They have all these guys in Washington and the NSA, you know, who do all this secret stuff. Um, we are way ahead of them. And my question to you, Andrew, is really? Well, I, I, uh, I like to think so. Um, that is no reason to rest on our laurels. I do believe that all of these... Um, threat actors are uh, actively collecting zero-day um, um, vulnerabilities. Um, I believe they have been for quite a while. Zero-day means? Zero-day means a, a currently undiscovered or unpublished vulnerability. So that, you know, if I, if, if I know that I want to perhaps get into a Siemens controller, for example, and I've discovered a way to do that, um, and no one knows about it, I keep that. Or I sell that to some of these threat actors, for example. There are people that make a living going and discovering those vulnerabilities and then auctioning them off. All over the world. For example, sure. It's so a way to make a good buck. We also buy those. So, you know, it's a, it's a free market economy in the globe. Um, I, um, I, I believe that as much of a threat as others pose, I believe we pose a similar threat to them. We are not um, uh, inept in this space. Um, I think we are, like to show a lot less of our capability than we have. Um, I think in the cases that you're speaking about, perhaps um, the, these actors um, are showing, uh, they're raising their skirt a little bit high. This stuff is trackable. It's easy to figure out where it's come from. It's easy to see its footprint, how it moves. Um, and so e when I say easy, I say there are people that are watching this stuff constantly as it unfolds, as it develops, and then studying the, the ramifications. So the, the, it's kind of easy for them to see the tools that are used. Um, and these tools are freely available for you and I to buy. Um, they're packaged, bundled, ready to I go. I want to talk about exploits. that because I've looked at that. Uh, that's Andrew Lanning. Uh, he's with Integrated uh, Security Technologies. Uh, we're talking about uh, cyber terrorism as a new normal in our world. Not only our country, our world. I'm going to take a short break and come back. And we're going to find out about these tools that you can do and I can do and anybody can do for the cost of nothing that are available on the web right now today. Become a cyber terrorist yourself. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. Hello, ha, huh? how you doing? It's me, Angus McTech, wishing you to welcome and join us to see us on Hibachi Talk on Think Tech Hawaii. Join my co-hosts, Gordo the Tech Czar and Andrew the Security Guy every Friday from 1300 to 1345. We look forward to seeing you. We'll talk tech and we'll have some wee bit of fun. And remember, let your wing gang free wherever you be. Aloha! Okay, we're back. We're live with Andrew Lanning talking about cyber terrorism as a new normal. 
So, you know, a few months ago, just for fun, I decided to go on the web and I, you know, I Googled... Um, for fun? Yeah, for fun. You know, just, you know, curiosity, it drives okay. us. Here at Think Tech, we're curious about everything, All right? right. <clears throat> and lo and behold, I found a bunch of programs that allowed me to hack. And they were free, actually free. Um, and I, I know they're not the big time stuff that you would use, for example. I was going to say, and, they might not be any good. <laughs> <laughs> they might not even work. But if I wanted to be a cyber terrorist, if I wanted to sure. discover some backdoor thing that I could sell, say, to the Russian government, uh, you know, how, how so, would I do that? Well, so anybody, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't actually can't sit here and say that I know the law around reverse engineering things or exploring them for vulnerabilities. I do know um, that once you find a vulnerability there, you know, we have, you know, the white hat hacking team that tends to send that vulnerability out to that manufacturer, ask them to patch it. They'll tenderly ask a few times. They'd like to be paid. Um, if you don't patch it or ignore them, oftentimes they will release that information into the wild and then the manufacturers will patch it. Mm -hmm. You know, manufacturers have a part to play. Remember I talked about we have people, products, and processes, right? Um, the manufacturers, by and large, the makers of many of these IoT devices specifically um, have been riding a wave of consumerism and they have been making money and they're not really willing to uh, add expense to their manufacturing process unnecessarily. And as long as people keep consuming these products, these insecure products, they're not going to fix them. So there's one issue there um, that's a piece of this equation. But um, if you've discovered zero days, uh, zero day vulnerabilities um, in, an, in an item, and this is something you would probably be doing in a lab, the feasibility of the vulnerability, of using the vulnerability, some are, some are simpler, some are very difficult, some are man in the middle type attacks where you've actually got to be sitting on the device already. You know, they're not necessarily available through an, FT, an open FTP port, um, but some are, are very poor manufacturing flaws where the, um, the default password and the default log on are actually available always even after you've changed them as the administrator they're available through an obscure port on the device that's open wow. like ftp for example yeah so these are this is a poor manufacturing flaw that i was sort of talking about which underwriter labs is working to fix uh we're at, we have the series 2900 coming out which we're working on is the there's a piece for the life safety products there's a piece for the uh, healthcare products, you know, you, 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 you're concerned about your, your pump, you know, your, uh, your uh, sugar pump getting, you know, artificially yeah. hacked and then, you know, they change the dosage, things like that in a yeah, hospital. Yeah, yeah. Then there's also the program, the, the PLCs, the industrial control system piece. So uh, Underwriter Labs is working its way into that. Industry is obviously going, wait, we're not ready, don't wait, you know, cross their arms. They, they want to fix it themselves, but they haven't for 20 years now. So I don't believe that they will. Can so, the government incentivize uh, them to fix it? I think they've made enough money that government expects the, the industry, ultimately you and I will pay. These, the better hardened devices will go up. The consumer, what I call this, this IoT to me is this consumer level of product that I think will always be fraught with its vulnerabilities. You know, the consumers are the last to get... Um, take advantage of better technologies, right? It's ultimately prices trickle down but into the, the consumer, consumer grade. The consumers, product. the guys with the the old junky PCs on their desks. Yeah, they're killing you know, us. Yeah. Well, what what I mean though is, um, if I have an old junky PC on my desk and I don't have virus protection in there, then it, it's only a matter of time before I get a virus. Right. I can sit there and watch seconds. it. It's a few seconds. A few seconds. Windows ninety five today is broken in under a minute. Doesn't you plug it in? It's on, it's in, you cannot Incredible. patch it any longer. Now you can say, oh, that's bad because then my machine will slow down and it no, won't work right. But it's much worse than that. Oh yeah, it becomes because a, there's a bot on there. It becomes sure. a tool and agent for the bad guys. Yes. And then there's a global network of all this malevolent software out there, and I am I'm part of it. Yeah. You're part of the problem. I'm part of the problem. Sure. And I mean, there must be millions and millions of, of junk old computers out there which don't have virus protection, or do for that matter, yeah. and, and have these bots on them. And if somebody pushes a button in Vladivostok, you know, to activate all these bots, we'll have a well, terrible price to pay. So you can go rent time on them. You and I can rent time. If I wanted to attack this studio, for example, and shut down this broadcast, I can rent time from those bots, from those bot armies. And they sell it by the minute, by the uh, half hour, really? by the by the packet size. Sure. So it, what what does it take to take you down? If I so I don't I don't want to buy 
um, um, 600 um, um, uh, terabyte. I don't want to buy 600 terabytes uh, per second, for example, or, or megabytes per second. But if I only need 100, for example, so it's very tailorable to whatever I need. Maybe I just want to shut down a competitor of mine for a few hours because he's having a sale, for example. So this is all freely available. Uh, it's illegal. Don't get me wrong. You don't want to be involved well, in it. I could find it on the web. I could find it on the web, and I sure. could buy time on the bots sure. to do horrendous things sure. in, in, around now, the world. Now, just I, just trust me. If you if you in, engage in this type of activity, I'm quite confident there's people that know you're engaging in it, right? This is a, again how we talked about. We're also watching. Now, right. you know, we have organizations that are um, taking care of the security of our nation. Um, you know, and they are monitoring this stuff. So just because you go out of your home first time and you want to rent a bot, they they, they want to watch what you want. This means they're going to come knock on your door. They're busy. They're well, really I'm chasing. A terrorist, they're I chasing not? really bad guys, but they're chasing bad. Now, if you're successful yeah. and you start to show a pattern of this yeah. and you actually cause some damage, you yeah. may find somebody at your door saying, "Hey, Jay, we'd just like to talk to well, you. And by the way, we're going to take your computer with us and keep all your syslog files so we can demonstrate in court what you've yeah, been up to. Yeah, and you can prove a case against me, and I might get six months in the can. Or you might get a slap on the wrist. Might it's get hard a, to say. Might get Depends on the, the amount of damage. Because it's cost. white collar crime just for kids. Sure. And uh, you're not treated as having real criminal scienter over it. Yeah. And so I think a lot of them either don't get prosecuted or get away completely. And so that's got to change, don't I, you think? I, I sat through um, the uh, FBI cyber, or not cyber, but the FBI Citizens Academy this year, earlier, th earlier last year, sorry. And uh, we, we got a, a briefing, you know, from all the different departments. And I was amazed, and I kept bringing up to them how often these white-collar criminals only get very lenient sentences, in my opinion. Like, like six years seem to be a very common thing for really hundreds of millions of dollars worth of theft or fraud or whatever, oftentimes. Now, they did talk, the cyber unit has a very difficult time building its cases, right, because a lot of this stuff is international. That's what Donald Trump said yesterday. Yeah. And it's they, hard to prove hacking. It isn't hard to prove it. Attributing exactly who it's to takes a lot of forensic investigation, and yeah. that's expensive. So um, I'm going to talk about that with the records group. But you do want to, you know, if, you're, if you have liability for information you're storing, and let's say you just decide, well, I'm going to keep two years of email. Well, you know how much you might have to pay to have gone through if you get named in a suit? Two years of email. So sure. maybe you want to limit uh, the amount of data that you store. Um, from a liability perspective, just so that the, the, in, the discovery is not as expensive should you be named in a case, for example. Huge expense on discovery of discovery old emails. All this, for, go all this forensic it. work is very, very expensive yeah. in examining firewall logs and syslogs and all yeah. stuff. But, so. but the likelihood is that there's really not, not enough government prosecutorial interest in pursuing these cases and, and putting bad actors in jail for significant periods of time. And they do it, and they essentially get away with it, even if they have done real damage to the community. I was amazed to find, and I, I, I can tell you that there are, there's a lot of value gained in watching these actors until they really go too far. There was a group of um, gentlemen recently, eight of them, who were arrested for, found, they got into the controls in a dam in the United States. Uh, they actually got to the controllers of the sluice ways. These were Americans. Yes. No, they were not Americans. They could have opened the sluice ways. The sluice ways were offline for maintenance, but they did get that far. Now, these guys had been doing a lot of other stuff, and our services had been watching them for a while doing crime, but once they went that far, they went and got them. Yeah. So what I'm saying is they gain a lot of, int you know, they're gathering intel, right? And, you know, so maybe they put up with, a little bit of this and a little bit of that to get learn more about the operations of the team and learn more about the team members and all that kind of stuff. So gathering intel, and I was, when I left, I was like, wow, you know they're bad guys. Me, I wouldn't have the patience to do that kind of investigation, but uh, I'm glad that we have people that do. Yeah, I hope we continue that. But here we are, <clears throat> and it has never been raised so starkly in this country uh, where some foreign actor has manipulated, I think it's clear that some foreign actor has manipulated our election process. And it's not clear whether, you know, the ballot box was tampered with one way or the other. I mean, mm. I, or public I think people, opinion or whatever it may be. Sure. It's public opinion that was sure. tampered with, which is actually the root of the ballot box, you know. Could very it's well. It's more leverage there than on the ballot box. So you've got to give them credit for going to where decisions are made. And I think that Russia has done that before. Arguably, we have done it before. Um, and I think that's the new normal, too, manipulating public opinion um, with false news, fake news, and then fake news about the fake news. You get, there was an article about that too, how the people 
who are generating the fake news, when charged with generating fake news, they come back and, and say that the charge is itself fake news, so everybody's doing fake news. <laughs> then you can't believe anything anymore. So my question to you here at our closing, Andrew, okay. is all regard to reality, to all that we know, to all that you know in the business, what's going to happen here? Where is the world going? What is this new normal? Where is it going to take us? Is it, are we going to resolve this? Are we going to, you know, sort of compensate for the problem, deal with it? Or are we going to, you know, sink the ship under it? Oh, we'll all keep getting better at the game. It's a game. It's a game. And we'll all keep getting better at it and better at it and better at it. I, I, where it ends up, I don't know. If we start to lock countries out of each other, lock everyone's doors, lock all their power grids, and that becomes the, the game, so be it. But, it, you know, I think the world economy... Uh, we'll we'll keep a lot of that in check. You know, we, yeah. we it doesn't it doesn't help any piece of the n the world anymore to have a nation shut down. So yeah. I don't know. It's interesting to see what that type of impact would be. Yeah. Well, you know, Donald Trump um, and for that matter, Putin have been talking about escalating nuclear uh, proliferation these days, and of course, North Korea. So we have this whole proliferation on us, and then Donald Trump says that's not going to happen. Well, it remains to see be seen whether that happens. But I think one thing is clear is that the same, as you mentioned, the same principle of deterrence is present on cyber terrorism. Yeah. It's the same thing. If I know that you can, you know, really hurt me, uh, and we both have arguably equal capability with each other, I'm not going to hurt you because I don't want, I don't want the payback. It, it's surely a, a thing of where we don't know what we don't know. <laughs> and again, that goes with hiding all those vulnerabilities that everyone knows about, you know. And so that's a... You know, we don't know what they know, and they don't know what we don't know, and it's it's an interesting it's an interesting detente, I guess, of, of a new kind, perhaps. You know, yeah. um, if I were a world leader, it would uh, it would concern me. Uh, I don't think any of them will let up with their efforts to to raise their game. Let's put it that way. It's the new normal. It's the new normal. Thank you, Andrew. Andrew Lanning. Great it. to have you on the show. Great we got to, to do here. this again. It's fun. <laughs> Hello.